Grouping has all kinds of advantages for different organisms. Let's focus now on the predator. What kind of advantages do they get by living in groups? Well, in some cases, it's pretty clear that by living in a pack, that hunters can be more successful, especially when they're trying to capture large and dangerous prey, okay? A good example of this is the Cape hunting dog. This is an animal that lives in Africa. Here they are with a wildebeest. And a dog is not a very big predator. And so a single hunting dog has almost no chance of catching a wildebeest by itself. But if we have a pack, they work together, they distract, they control it from various different angles, and the pack almost always succeeds. So it's a huge advantage of hunting in a pack when the prey is a lot larger than you are. Now, predators don't just need to cooperate to capture individual prey. Most animals are playing a very long-term game where they have to be able to get resources over a very, a very long period of time, a long enough period of time to be able to raise their offspring. And what we see in a lot of predators is that group living improves access to resources through group territoriality. Looking at my own species, the African lion, we can find a perfect example of a group territorial species. Although the lion is often viewed as the king of beasts, implying a single monarch, in fact, male lions form coalitions, and the larger the coalition, the more successful. Female lions, too, are social. And in fact, they're the only social cat. What we're going to see is that both males and females are incredibly territorial. And this is when lions are their most cooperative. As we can see from these pictures of these four females that have discovered a stranger within their territory, they surround him and attack all at the same time. Highly coordinated, extremely dangerous for the victim. This is how most lions die, is they're killed by other lions. And females generally kill females, males kill other males. We have performed a series of experiments to study group territoriality in lions. We use the lion's roar as our experimental treatment. A roar is a territorial display. If a lion is roaring, they say, I live here, this is my land. Well, we record their roars with tape recorders, and then we play them back through loudspeakers to other lions to see how they respond. So we have played the roars of a single female to groups of different sizes. As far as the lions are concerned, there's a stranger in their territory. This is a threat to their ownership of this land. They don't like it. It makes them very uncomfortable. But what do they do about it? If we play the roar of just a single female like we're hearing now, a single female out in the open is a bit cautious. If she were to approach that roar, thinking that's a real lion, it would be one-on-one. -on -one. If there's two females who hear that roar, they outnumber the opponent now two to one, and they're somewhat more likely to go. But it's not until they outnumber the opponent three to one that they almost always go. So there's comfort and security that we are going to be able to defeat that stranger in our territory. If we then play back the roar of three females, That's pretty intimidating. And so when three females are roaring, a single female isn't going to approach. She's outnumbered three to one. Two against three, they're not going to approach. But three against three is about the same as one against one. Four against three is about the same as two against one. And five against the three is about the same as three against one. Now when we played just a single female's roar, 
A group of three females were very bold, and they would approach the speaker almost every time. But when the group of three hears three roaring females, they're as inhibited as one against one. With four against three is the same as two against one, and five against three is the same as three against one. So as long as we safely outnumber the opponents, we'll go forward. And this is actually quite a remarkable result because it shows that our lions, which I always thought of as just big, dumb, blonde cats, can count. They count how many of us there are, how many of them there are, and they're doing a calculation. Well, there's five of us versus three of them. We'll go forward. There's two of us against one of them. Eh, maybe we'll go forward. They are so aware of the numbers because if they can outnumber their opponents, they can win the fight, and they will go forward with great confidence. Why is it that lions show this peculiar kind of group territoriality? We think it has to do with the habitat. Lions live in savanna. Savanna is defined by large areas of grassland with just a few dotted areas of woodlands. The lions need to ambush their prey. They can't catch anything out in the open. They have to lurk where there's good cover. But there's only a few places with good cover. If they have access to an area like this back here where they can ambush their prey, they can get lots to eat. But that's a really valuable piece of real estate. That's an area that's really worth defending far more than that open area over there. Of all the cat species on Earth, lions are the only social cat. If you think of leopards, cheetah, they're all solitary. What is it about lions that makes them live in groups when all the others are solitary? Well, to study this, we used a computer simulation. And what we wanted to do was to mimic the characteristics of the savanna habitat, which is that there are only a few areas that are really valuable where you can catch a lot of food, and they're, so, they're small enough that you could try to monopolize them and keep everybody else away. And so that's portrayed on this screen here where the bright, bright green, those are the really valuable bits of real estate. Where it's darker, there's not enough food. We then start out in our simulation model with everybody behaving like a leopard, where there's one female who might have an offspring, and when her offspring grows up, it leaves. And the extent of her territory is given by this outer blue line. So we've got a lot of different leopards living around here. But within our simulated Serengeti here, we're going to have a mutant. And this female allows her daughter to stay with her. And so they team up. Now it's mother and daughter and eventually sisters, so we'll have a pride. Their territories are outlined in yellow. So as we run this along, you'll see that the lions are quickly able to take over the best territory, the brightest green habitat. They get bigger and bigger as they have more and more daughters, and then they start sending their own excess daughters out elsewhere. And eventually, their daughters, their descendants, go and take over hot spots over here, and eventually take over the whole habitat. So what we've done is to have the evolution of sociality based on this group territoriality of these very valuable hot spots. So we have did this in a variety of different circumstances to mimic leopard lifestyle, lion lifestyle, tiger lifestyle. And what we see is that sociality is most likely to evolve where the animals live at a really high population density. And though I haven't mentioned that yet, the Serengeti with its one and a half million wildebeest has a phenomenal number of lions. You have a much higher density there. The other is to have the savanna landscape. And so if you have these hot spots that are incredibly valuable, if you got all your reproduction from just a few places, well, you'd have to be a group to monopolize it. And so when we do a sort of space of possibilities, the sociality is in this black region. And so the black region is most likely in areas where there's huge variation in the habitat. Some places are these true hot spots, like in the savanna. And then we also see it in areas with really high population density. And population density matters because the more rivals there are, the more fighting you have to do. So these are the two factors that seem to have led to lions being the only special species that are social. Now, several times during the course, when we've looked at the evolution of behavior, I have used this silly cartoon to emphasize that selfishness is always expected 
We don't think that organisms should ever be very nice to each other. And we have our devil dogs up here, right, who fight each other. And we have our little angels down here who all get along, and it's wonderful, and it's hippy-dippy, and it's great, okay? Now, these devil dogs fight each other, okay? And so there are fewer than there would have been if they hadn't fought each other. But nevertheless, if a selfish individual is able to get into a generous population, it'll quickly spread because those angels haven't got a chance against these evil individuals, okay? So we've said over and over again that selfish traits can spread even if it's damaging to the social group as a whole, okay? So there are fewer devil dogs than there would be these, but if the devil dogs can invade, they'll take over. So selfishness is what we expect. Now, let's think about group territoriality. Let's think about the lions. Here we have a situation where you've got some selfish individuals that fight amongst each other, and these always get on really well with each other, okay? Maybe some of them are lost because of that selfish behavior. Now there's a difference in group size. If there's a battle between groups, and the victorious group kills the subordinate group, this is a totally different ball game. This is where group selection can work. Whenever large groups cooperate to kill smaller groups, we expect to see extraordinarily high levels of cooperation within the group because your companions now are your true, true lifeline in the competition against your neighbors. Now, this is an important conceptual framework for thinking about species that are very close to our own. In fact, we're going to compare chimpanzees to humans. Chimpanzees have male communities, and the males work very closely together to attack neighbors. This is a bunch of males from one social group in Africa who captured a stranger from a neighboring group, and they're killing it. They actually bit off its balls, broke its legs, and left it to die. Now, we see similar kinds of gang behavior in our own species. It's males in gangs fighting against other gangs of males. Typically, they find a single victim from a different group so they can kill it, and they rely on an element of surprise. There's almost an eerie parallel between chimps and humans around this group territoriality. Territoriality being the basis of why they want to get rid of the strangers. So, we've been looking at the behavioral ecology of sociality. We've seen that group living confers individual advantages to both predators and to prey. And now we've seen for the first time that group selection can become as important as individual selection in explaining certain aspects of behavior.